Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks by the New Art School. Our guest today is Bradford Hansen Smith. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Latars. It's uh, good to talk to you again. It's fantastic talking to you. You're here for the third time, and you know uh, this podcast is really, really, really likes your work. Well, um, yeah, the last two times we did a lot of folding and talked about the process, and but um, I don't think we need to go over that again. There was a lot of information for yes. anybody that wanted to go into it. Um, what I would love to talk about is what underlies this process, which is one of observation and reflection. And that seems pretty simple. We we observe lots of things and we think about those things we, we look at. And there is a difference between observing and seeing. And um, having come from, from an art background and having, having been using my eyes and hands since I can remember, um, seeing was just part of what was one of my tools to see things and then to make things, replicas, images. Um, and it wasn't until I started folding circles that I began to really understand the difference between seeing and observing. And we're living in a, a culture, a world culture right now, where seeing becomes more and more important. We're, we're taking in information visually even more than, you know, reading or in other ways. It certainly has replaced face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and the pace is increasing. We see something and then we're shown something else again. And so very quickly we go from seeing this to seeing that to seeing the next thing. And pretty soon we're not even seeing what we're, see we're looking at. We're anticipating what we're going to see. And this is what, you know, how our brains are being reconditioned. So what I found when I started folding circles is that I could fold it in half. I could see that. And then all of my condition of what that means came up and it was like, okay, what do I do next? Show me something else to see, to look at, that I can do. And what I found was that I didn't know what to do with the circle. Once I folded it in half, which we all do, I didn't know what else to do with it. Because we don't fold circles, so there's nobody out there to say, well, the next step is... Um, and they would only be giving me a formula anyway. And and because at that time, I could find nobody folding circles. Origami was a big thing. We fold squares. We fold, you know, other shapes. So, um, so to observe became very important. And to observe means I had to spend time looking at what I was seeing. And, it's, and observing is taking the time to see... The parts, the pieces, the relationships, the properties of what it is I'm seeing. So then I begin to observe the parts and the pieces. Then I have to think about those parts and pieces. And how, how does the circle show me they go together? What's the relationship of that crease in the center? And it's through semicircles and the points and the lines and that flat plane. And then in thinking about that, it's like, oh, I've got the information to know what to do next. Nobody has to tell me. I've observed what it has told me that I have a choice about now. Um, so... There really is a difference between observation and seeing. And anybody with reasonably functioning eyes can see. It's not in our education to observe. And it's even less in our education to think about and reflect on what we have learned. Because we're told to think about and reflect on what we're told, what we've been given. 
rather than what we observe experientially. So anyway, um, this is all very conceptual, and um, it may mean something to some people and not to others. And there's no way I can give you the experience of folding a circle in half, except maybe at this moment, whoever's listening and yourself left there, get a circle. And even if you have to shut this video off and go find one or cut one out until you've got a circle. Yeah. Then we can have, we can have a shared experience as remote as we are, of folding it in half. And we all kind of know what that is, so we just take it and we, you know, put the edge together and then we crease it. Let me see if it's, okay, this should make it easier to see. So you've got the circle and you've got a crease in it. What information do we have observing? In other words, usually when I work with, with anybody, the next question is, what do we have before? I mean, what do we have now that we didn't have before? Before we folded it, what do we have now? So we just can't say, I folded it in half, and then it's like, what do I do next? Because here's the information to know what to do next. And so then we have to reflect a little bit on, on what we've done. So what are your observations about what we just did. What do you see in your circle? Well, we've created a kind of duality, haven't we? From, from, from the whole. There's a duality, yes. We, we recognize that. And that's where we get stuck. Because all of our thinking is a, a, a thinking in terms of dualities. Good and bad, right and wrong, left and right, you know, positive and negative. It goes on endlessly because that becomes the conceptual context of how we begin to see things. And we make judgments. You did something I don't like. That's negative. It's wrong. It's bad. Because you did it differently than me. And what I did was right. And what you did is wrong. Now, you know, get in line. Here's the line. There is no right and wrong to this line. It's the first thing that happened is we have a line down the center. My question then is, how do we know it's the center? How do we know that's the center of the circle? Because we've joined the edges. Because we joined the edges. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That tells us they're the same. Uh, very rarely, even math people don't tell me they're congruent. Yet we have a math term that says, if these are the same, they're congruent. One fits right onto the other. Yeah. And so that's what I look for in an answer. Somebody who will say, one fits right onto the other, which tells me they saw what they were doing. They didn't just conceptually fold it in half and say, well, it's in half because it's in the middle. It's interesting how many different ways people answer that question. What is there now that was not there before? I had one fifth grade girl, and um, everybody was telling me what they saw. And, and I looked at her, and she was thinking about it. I said, what is there now that you see that you didn't see before? She said, a shadow, a shadow. I had the same look on my face. Really? And then she says, yeah, you see the shadow? See the shadow? She was seeing and registering. Her observation was about the light. Yeah. Was not about the object of the circle. She was seeing the light and the shadow. Well, it's still a duality, right? Dark and light. But she was seeing it differently. Her observation was different than everybody else's. I've never had another person in 35 years of doing this to tell me they saw a shadow. Taco, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> just all kinds of, you know, a mouth. But these are not what we see. These are the images in our minds that we make connections to. They're not about observation. She was observing something, the light and the shadow. 
which means she was observing the movement. So oftentimes the question is, how did you, how did you fold the circle? How did you do it? What did you do to make it in half? Now, that's a question that doesn't register with a lot of people because we don't observe what we do. We see what we've done. And we see what other people have done. We don't observe what we do. I've only had, out of all those years, less than a handful of kids who could tell me what they did. And they would say, well, I took a point, you know, measured a point on one side, and and I put it to the other side, and then I looked to see that everything was lined up, and then I creased it. I says, okay, so you took an imaginary point, and you put it onto another imaginary point, but you weren't fully conscious of what you were doing, so you had to look and see if everything was lined up. Whereas if you had closely observed two points coming together, you would have seen that everything was lined up, that they were congruent. Now, counter this with the with, with the kid who <laughs> or person who's going to fold it in half, and I say, okay, I'll fold it in half. I got it in half. I said, you got it in half. You go, yeah, I got it in half. Now, you and I can see that that's not in half. One is shorter than the other. Yeah. So we have this generalization, this generalized concept of in half. That's in half. And then I have to show them the difference, you know, between it being touching. And, and then they can recognize it. But before, they don't have the experience to know what half is but they have the concept, which makes it very easy if you're trying to divide a, a pizza in half. You can always fudge and get yourself the bigger half. The bigger half doesn't exist. It's a lie. We talk about bigger halves all the time. Um, so anyway, once, once they see it, then they fold it in half and they do it pretty accurately. The other aspect of that is taking an imaginary point, touching another imaginary point, knowing that it's in half, creasing it. You don't have to think other than putting two points together. Now, we're going to do a little sidetracking here for a minute. And I'm going to take another circle. And you can do this too. Yep. Take your circle. It's not folded. And, and put a point, put a mark right on the edge. Now, even five and six-year-olds understand this. What can we do with one point? Nothing. Nothing. You need at least two for there to be a relationship. Yeah. So you put another point somewhere else on that circle. Now you have a relationship of two points. And what do we do with those two points? How do we show that relationship? We connect them. We connect them with a line. We draw a line between them. That's not the relationship. That's simply the connection. It shows the separation between the points. We measure. Geometry, earth measure. It's about measuring the earth and things of the earth. And here's two things. So we measure between them. And the easiest way to measure is draw a line, connecting them. That's not real. If you and I have a relationship, we have to touch in some way. And we're using this technological medium to do that. But it's a form of touching. It's not just drawing a line between you and me and saying that's our relationship. So we touch it, and that's what everybody does. I take these two points, and then touch them together, and then trace it. And we didn't have to look. All we had to do was touch those two points together. Now, observe what's there that was not there before. The line, we didn't have that before. Two more points. The two points that we imagined that we made real. So there's a lot of information there. What do we think about it? How do we fruct on four points on this edge of the circle? 
It is divided in half. Now, a lot of times people say, well, there's a center to it. Yeah. I say, where do you see a center? <laughs> we know the line is in the middle of the circle, and the center of that line is somewhere, and you can approximate, but where is it? It doesn't. It's not there. The circle doesn't have a center. So that takes us to a whole other direction of reflection. If we were taught the circle has a center because we use a compass to draw it, we don't observe what that compass does. It rotates on the outside, and that gives us the marking of a circle, the circumference. But if we observe the compass on the center point, that's also going in a circle. It's rotating 360 degrees. So the compass is giving us two circles, one very large one, which is what we want, and one very small one. And we can't even see how small that is because concentric circles go infinitely in as much as they go infinitely out. You can set that compass anywhere. There's a physical limitation in terms of the smallness of setting the compass because the compass jams up against itself. So we've done an abstraction. We say that's the center point. It doesn't move. That's not. So every circle has a center to it. And yet, paper plates that I bought the store don't have centers to them. I can take a plate and draw it on a piece of paper and it doesn't have a center to it, but it's a circle. Yeah. So this is part of the conceptual misconception that has conditioned us. In other words, the tool we use to draw a circle has conditioned our mind to think the circle has a center. Now think about that in terms of technology and how technology is conditioning the mind to what it wants to give us or what somebody wants to give us through the technology. We've been conditioned educationally through the technology of printing, books, videos. How often does the teacher actually demonstrate, put the videos aside, put the books aside, say, we're going to explore through observation and then thinking about what we observe. I mean, think about that in terms of ecology and how screwed up the planet is in terms of, you know, the weather conditions, the, the creature conditions, you know, everything is total mess. How do we observe that? We can see it. We can see it's clear. <laughs> I can see that my weather patterns this year are different than last year. Why? Because of technology. What we've developed. And we've developed it without observing what we've, what we've created. And we have not even reflected on what we have done. Had we, we wouldn't be in the condition we're in. So what's missing in terms of what we're talking about, how to fix the world? to change it, to make it better, to rebalance, to get rid of the garbage. Well, first we have to think about where's the garbage come from? Stuff we throw away and we don't want anymore. Where did it come from before that? And it's, it's a process of reflecting back to origin. Circle. We start with the circle. That's the origin. Well, is it? Where did the circle come from? I bought it from the store. You know, I cut a piece of paper. No, the circle is an idea. And we give it a form. And then we believe that's what it is. But the idea of a circle had to initially come from one of my far past ancestors and yours who was looking at the sun and had a concept of what it looked like. And he goes into the cave or goes to a rock wall and he draws a circle. He makes an image of his experience. And then he does that for thousands of years until people just believe that that, that image has a name. It's a circle. In whatever language, we call it a circle. That's what it is. And we, we lose the, the experience of that connection of observation. 
We're no longer observing the sun. We're drawing pictures of it. We don't ask it, you know, when a child is learning to draw. We teach them to draw a circle, make the sun, make a face, put eyes and nose in it, the things we see, but we don't tell them anything about the circle. Where'd it come from? Why is it there? You know, and I'm just making connections here. But, you know, one of the first things kids ask, I can remember myself asking, where did I come from? Who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? Um, where am I going? You know, I mean, <clears throat> these questions are inherent in the curiosity it comes with being a conscious creature. And that can get conditioned really quickly by saying, oh, don't worry about that, or a parent not even answering, but diverting a kid to a more reasonable question rather than how to get here. Oh, we'll talk about that later when you get older. That's not good enough. How to get here? Who am I? You know, we've got to answer these questions for each other. Because if we can't answer them for each other, we're not answering them for ourselves. And then we don't know who we are, what we are, where we are, what our responsibility is for being whoever we think we are. And then that gets put on the environment and we have no responsibility. We, we basically take what we want, do what we want with it, and then spit it out. So that's where all the garbage comes from. We've taken it from the environment. It didn't come from nowhere. You know, our cars, it's just a bunch of dirt that we've processed. And we've outfitted with rubber wheels and plastic parts. And it's a very convenient thing. And we never think about it. We're driving around on the earth, in the earth, which is what we're doing. It's just been reformed. So there is an analogy to the circle. Because when we form a tetrahedron, an octahedron, icosahedron, any of these, these things we've given names to, these geometric figures, that we think are separate and isolated, definable and measurable. And therefore, we can determine the relationship between them. Relationship between the cars, as you go down the highway, we've gotten really good in intuitively knowing where we are spatially. But it's not thinking, it's a condition. It's a body condition that understands spatially how to navigate with other <laughs> pieces of dirt on the highway, whether it's a rock or another car. This, this is part of the confusion we're dealing with today. What is real and what is not real? Is what I'm telling you a lie or is there truth to it? Is, is what I'm saying a fantasy? Is it just a flight of my imagination and I'm just being creative and expressing myself? It depends. Or is there some truth? How do we know? It depends where you're observing it from. So the only way I know if somebody's telling me the truth or not, aside from, well, it's touching. It's touching the, the feelings, the energy response that I have to that other person to know whether they're lying to me, whether they're telling me something that's true to their experience, whether they're sharing themselves with me or whether they're sharing somebody else with me. See, if I'm paying attention, if I'm reflecting on my response, then that gives me a good gauge to know what's coming in and how to deal with it and where it comes from. This is all about observation. Observation is it's touching. Touching with your eyes, touching with your mind, your ears, your body, touching in some form. And the only form that we have is energy. That's the only form we have. Science tells us that. We are nothing but a bunch of frequencies and modulated energies and, you know, various circuits that are all interconnected that allow us, the body, to function as it needs to without having to think about it. Is there intelligence in the world? It's organized. 
It's ordered. It has meaning to us. It has to be. But how we define that intelligence becomes part of the issue. Do we see two halves? Do we see a taco? Do we see a shadow? What is it we see? Through observation. Not what we believe by seeing. Because what we see, we believe because we've been conditioned to. Because it has a name. And we can call it what it is. We don't have to look at it anymore. We don't have to observe. So we've only begun here. Let's give it some reality. You want to know whether this is my imagination. Take your pencil and connect all four points on the circumference. Okay, so we have the line and we have the four points. So let's just connect them all. Now we're, we're, we're getting to that stage where we can draw those lines of connection and we can measure. But what we're measuring is the proportional relationship of the movement of two points. So here's what I have. Now, if you've done this, of tariffs, did you do this? No, I didn't do the, the extra line. I didn't do the extra line on the top. Okay, so do this to your circle. Show the, show the crease, the four points, and draw the lines between them. Okay. You got that? Yep. Okay, hold it up. What do you see? What do we, so we can all see. Hold it up so we can see it. It, it, it doesn't fit in the camera. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. Uh, uh, anyway, just we can see it on, on your own on, on your on your own circle because it doesn't. Kind okay, of, so it's, so it's, big, it's quite big. This this is the problem with technology. It only shows us what it wants to show us. <laughs> it will not give us free access to each other because in a classroom, everybody does this, yeah. and we all hold it up and we all look at each other's kite shape. None of them are the same. Because nobody picked the same two points. Some people put points here, or here, or here, or here. So everybody has a different kite shape. Now, let's reflect a little bit on that observation of everybody did the same thing, but the expression was different in every case. Because nobody picked the same two points. So reflecting on that, I could say, Everybody is uniquely different. We don't really believe that, do we? Because we make generalizations about people. If, if, if I meet somebody, right away I have a generalization of category. Are they a, a regular polyhedron, a semi-regular polyhedron? Are they an octahedron? Are they a tetrahedron? Where do I put them? And I meet a stranger and I say, where do I put them? Oh, they're a different color from me. I put them over there. They speak a different language. Their accent is different. Their hair color is different. They're big, small. Where do I put them? There's a category for them somewhere. All you're doing is you're categorizing what you're seeing. You're not observing the uniqueness, the difference in that person and everybody else I know. And if I don't treat them with that, that dignity of individuality, the respect to who they are, then I don't know who they are, and I put them in a box, and pretty soon I close the lid, and they can't breathe anymore. But it's not my problem, right? We do that with people. We do it with everything we take from the earth. We give it a name, we classify it, we put it in the box, we talk about thinking outside of the box. How does a fish think outside of water? How does he swim outside of water? We have created our own conceptual boxes, and we can't get out of them because we don't know how. And, you know, we come up with all these different ideas. And there again, whose idea are you going to believe? I pay you so much money for this process of getting out of my own box. A self-help program. Spiritual religious, scientific, whatever it is, psychologically, emotionally, whatever my habits are, 
I'm going to give you the money and you're going to tell me how to get out of my box. And it never works. You might expand the size of your box a little bit. We're still wanting to figure out how to get out of the box, which we ourselves have created. I didn't create this circle. I got it from the store, yeah. But um, I didn't create it. It's an idea. It was an idea that was here long before. So let's go back and look at this. Everybody has a, a separate kite shape. They're all the same. What do we say? They're all the same, but everyone looks different. Everyone looks different, but we all did the same thing. And we can now say, okay, let's go further into it. Let's reflect on this quadrilateral, this kite shape. The more names we can give it, the more it becomes. If it's quadrilateral, then we know right away it's got four sides. If it's a kite shape, we have to think about it, kite shape. They have four sides too, but they kind of look triangular. So how many triangles are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have eight different kinds of triangles. We have scaling, we have obtuse, we have regular. We don't, the only thing we don't have is an equilateral triangle. We have all other kinds of triangles. We have all the angles we could want. You see, this is folding this in half. From flat to flat, we folded it 180 degrees to 180 degrees. We didn't go anywhere, but we did see the shadow of the movement. When you're working with two, with two, two dimensions, 2D, you start here, you finish here, you're the same place. Didn't go anywhere. There was no shadow, nothing to observe, no movement. It's why we have this thing called projective geometry. All geometry is projection. You have a circle, you're projecting a center point. And you can prove it because the compass makes a center point. But that's a belief in what we see it's not an observation about what happens. So if there's a very small infinitesimal circle in the center, and that itself goes in further, just as this circumference can be larger and larger, why don't we ever use the circle as a demonstration of infinity? Why do we only use numbers and then you can always add one more, or you can always take one away from. So you have infinite in both directions. The circle shows us infinity in both directions. And not one of those circles is the same as any other. If they have a different diameter, a different measure, it's a different circle. So I can take this circle in half, and I can take a larger circle and I can fold it in half. I've got two half circles, but they don't match to that because they're of a different measure. They're concentrically, they go in infinitely. And they can concentrically go out infinitely. And not one of those circles is going to be the same measure as any of the others. And I have found that even a stack of paper plates that have been manufactured through a machine, the die cuts them all to the same size, they're not all the same size. There's a slight difference because of the fluting, because of all the other processes that are involved in it. Each one of them is slightly different. But in folding them, I can fudge, just like the person who doesn't quite fold it in half, and they call it in half, that's kind of fudging. It's, it's close enough. Close enough. I'm going to touch these fingers. They're touching. Well, that's close enough, or that's close enough. Where is Where does close enough drop off and it's not right? They're either touching or they're not touching. We're observing or we're not observing. We're reflecting on what we observe 
or we're not. And if we're not, then we're thinking about what we've been told, how we've been conditioned, and we're making connections to what we already know. It has nothing to do with the unknown. Observation has to do with the unknown. We only observe when we're curious, or if we feel we're in danger, if our life is in danger, we become observant. We just don't see what's going on. We observe what's going on if our life is at stake. And I would say that our lives are at stake today. And the reason, I think, is because we don't observe what we do and we don't think about what we observe or what we don't observe. We just look to see the results and know that they're, they're not touching. There's no alignment. What do we do about that? First thing we need to do is to observe what's going on. This means how we educate ourselves, which includes our young people and our own people and all of us in between and all of us that haven't been born yet. We need to educate ourselves to observe who we are, where we are, what we are, where we're going. What is our responsibility for being here? If I can answer those for myself, I haven't gone very far. I don't know what I don't know. If I can answer those in terms of all of us, then I know where I am. I know who I am. I know where I am. And I have an idea where I'm going. And there's a responsibility to that. But as long as the responsibility is to me, then I have no clue. I'm like that one point on the circle. And maybe I move myself over to the concept of a center and think that I'm the center of the circle of my world. And I'm the center of the circle of your world. There's something inherently destructive about about staying with this logic, this two-dimensional logic in a four-dimensional world. And that's what we've got. Our thinking, our logic is two-dimensional. It's a duality. And yet, if we go back, we have two halves. But it's only that line of division, that third element, that allows us to understand two halves. Without that line of division, without that third component, those halves don't exist. It's just a circle. And the circle without a folder does nothing. The folder without the circle understands nothing. The circle is whole. It's the only form that's inherently unified. It's a unity. And if the folder doesn't have unity, doesn't have an understanding of the wholeness, to do something with it, and the folder has nothing, understands nothing. And that's where we are today. Very quickly, things are becoming nothing. And we don't know what to do about it because we're in a, a box that we've created in our minds. I often think back to when I was a kid and they were there in Southern California, you know, with lots of fruits. And they were doing a lot of exploring of how to grow grapefruit or oranges in a cubic configuration so they could pack them more economically. Interesting concept. Why do we want to do that? Well, because we already have the boxes made and we can only get so many. There's a lot of wasted space in the box for the orange or the grapefruit. So if we can grow them as cubes, then we can fill up the box space. Well, who made the box in the first place? Who made the orange? Who made the grapefruit? We haven't reflected on clearly what we see, and we have done very little observation about it. Anyway, to the circle. Um, this idea of this, we can go much further into it because we now have four points on the circumference, 
As soon as those come off the flat plane, look what happens to the line of measure that separates them. It's no longer a line. It becomes an angle. The points are getting closer together. Boom. So what we see is this and this. Look at all of that. As soon as that's off the flat plane, you've got a tetrahedron pattern. One, two, three, four. Four points in space define a tetrahedron. You've got a triangle plane, a triangle plane, and you've got one here, a triangle plane here. You don't see it because it's an open plane. You don't see this one. That's a triangle. It's an open plane. So four triangle planes, two open and two solid, are tetrahedron pattern. Now, the angle is 180 degree angle. So that tetrahedron is different in each, each movement. It's changing. It's transforming to a different proportion. Proportions are changing until it comes flat again. Then all of a sudden, here, All right, let's, let's do this. One of the things we should have observed, although we didn't talk about it, maybe you did observe it, that that fold goes in both directions. It doesn't just go from flat to flat. It goes 360 degrees. It created a spherical path of movement in space. So that tells us the origin for the circle is a sphere. We look at the sun, that's spherical. We draw a circle of it. Old math books say we take the sphere and cut it in half and draw a picture of a, a great circle. Now we can get lesser circles, but a great circle. It's, it's all conceptual. So if the sphere is the only form that's inherently whole, that inherently embodies that concept of unity, because there's nothing on the outside of the sphere that tells us anything except its regularity of surface, no differentiation anywhere. When you compress that sphere down to a flat plane, you've got a horizontal movement. The Any vertical axis, whatever their angulation, whatever that vertical axis is, it will have a horizontal plane moving out from it. It's the implosion, the compression and explosion out. It's how galaxies are formed. We see this. How does the galaxy form? It's a little ball of coherent, unified energy that all of a sudden explodes. Well, maybe what that means is it implodes. It moves into itself. And all what we see is this spiraling upward, this circular disk of material, and it creates what we call a galaxy. We are part, and we're a very small part. This little sphere that we're on is a very small part of a very large galaxy in which we now know there are millions of galaxies out there. If nothing else, think about, reflect on that thought, that idea. That in itself gets you out of your box, puts you in a landscape that cannot be contained. Then we go back and we ask those questions. Who am I? Where am I? How did I get here? Where am I from? Where am I going? Now we have a context. We have a very large context. Now, do we take part of our, the, the inquiry, the inquiring part of our mind. Do we, do we use that? And we end up calling that science. And then we take another part of the mind and we take that same enlarged capacity and say, well, there's something I don't know. I'm going to call it God. Or I'm going to call it something. Call it a black hole. Call it the unknown. Call it singularity. Call it whatever you want. Names don't matter. 
of the idea that stimulates the mind to think about what it doesn't know and to observe what it has not seen. And we use tools to do that. We've developed a lot of tools. And so the, <laughs> the tools that I'm using, that Left Terrace is using to connect you and me, we've had a little glitch. They don't work as well as we think they do or as we would like them to do. So we fudge a little bit. We say, oh, well, that's close enough. It's not close enough. It's not touching. How do you touch a galaxy that you're a part of? How do you swim and understand the ocean you're swimming in? How do we understand millions of galaxies that are out there of which we are one? How do we understand the fact that we're even conscious of that? How does a little bug, a fly, understand themselves, who they are, where they're going, where they've been? They have a consciousness that stimulates their life force to do what they have to do within the confines of their context. And their context is what created them. And with that came some sense of what the human mind calls responsibility. And the bug mind probably is thinking, well, this is what I got to do. Otherwise, I don't survive. Anyway, uh, <laughs> back to the circle. <laughs> the wholeness. This is not a unit circle. Of course it is. That's, we talk about unit circles all the time in mathematics and this concept. It's not the reality of the unity of this shape. Now, this isn't just a shape. It's not a 2D circle. This has a front and a back, right? We see, we see the front. We see the back. We see that it can turn both ways. It can go the other way. There's also a dance taking place we have yet to recognize. It's not just a back and front, because now it has, it's a tri-unity. There are three parts, line of division and the two halves. It's a tri-unity. So we can do this. But as we turn that around, this is also, see there's, they're both turning the same direction. We can do that in different intervals. In other words, if we're going to go in that direction, one follows the other. But then the other can lead and the partner follow. So you, and you can change directions and you can change the intervals. You can hold on to the tetrahedron or move it out or close it up. What are the steps of this dance? How many different ways can we move together these two points and to what complexity? So we know that, let's reflect a little bit more on this. We go one direction, two directions. We have two halves, so that's four directions. And we have two sides. That's eight different directions of spherical movement. Eight different directions of spherical path in space, and they're all congruent. You can't tell one from the other. But we can observe that there are eight different directions. That's 360 degrees times eight. That's a lot of degrees. And we limit ourselves to 360. And in terms of most of our thinking, we limit it to 180. And we think we've gone somewhere. So let's go back and observe this circle before we fold it. Okay. If we're to describe it without these bridges and stuff that's been pressed into it, just as a paper circle front, and back. Two circles. Two circle planes. 
it has an edge, just like any coin, any cylinder, top, bottom. And that edge is perpendicular to the two circle planes, very much like the creation of a galaxy. A compression of the sphere creates a circular plane of which there's a top, a bottom, and an edge that is perpendicular. That edge is a surface. So we have three circle, three circles, tri-unity. Even before we fold it, it tells us this is tri-unity of three circle planes. We can take that a little bit further. If I take, here's another circle. Just happens this is a lid, so it's got an inside. <clears throat> but if this were flat like this side, then you could really see there is a perpendicular circle plane to the two horizontal planes. But we can also see that there's an edge here and an edge here. So we've got two edges holding three circle planes together. There is volume. This is the same volume of the sphere that was compressed down to this circle plane. Nothing's been added, nothing's been taken away. The volume is the same, the form is different. So this tells us that we have five circle five circuits, five circles, top, bottom, edge, and the two edges holding the three planes together, five. Why is five important? We don't really know much about five. We have all kinds of ideas about five being sign of some transcendental number. But the reflection of the number description of this will take us in a whole other direction. And, um, I don't think I want to go there right now, but there's plenty to explore. So we find that there are threes, triangles, there are squares, kite shape, quadrilaterals, three, four, and the five. The five is the unit itself, the circle of disk, because it has five circles, and through moving, all five, all these things start to happen. They become revealed. I'm not generating information. I'm moving the circle. The circle is generating that information and it's revealing what otherwise I don't see. But given some time, I am able to observe and then I can think about it. I got something to think about. Um, the, the circle pattern is seven. Because once we fold it in half, we fold it in half again three times. Three because it's a triunity, and there's consistency, and then we get three diameters. Those diameters give us seven points, one point of intersection between them in the center, and the six on the outside. One, seven. Seven points, three lines, one triunity which in itself is seven, because remember we're talking about the five as a number to describe this circular disk. It has volume inside. There's volume. There's volume in here. So that would be the sixth element, isn't it? We don't see it. We only see the outside, the container is what we see. We don't see what's inside. So that's the sixth component. The seventh is all the volume, the undefined volume outside of the circle. So that gives us seven parts. The outside, the inside, and the five that describes the object itself, seven. So the only pattern, circle pattern that exists is seven. The most combination of three of anything will be seven combinations. Any math person should know that. How many different ways can you combine three? Seven different ways. Um, so numbers become an important aspect of 
understanding what we're doing. But they're not arbitrary because they only have meaning in terms of the context we're using them. I have one circle. So what? I have one point. So what? I'm not going to add another one. I have two, three, four. It's a concept. It's a way of counting, keeping track, measuring. But it says nothing about relationship or proportion, or it answers nothing about those questions of who am I, where am I, how am I. It answers the questions of how tall am I, how much do I weigh, what's my IQ, what's my brain capacity. And these have become the important things in our lives. Think about it. I think about it a lot. I go into the go and see the doctor, go and see my insurance person, go where they want to know. What's your birthday? Used to be, what's your social security number? Used to be, you know, what's your address, where you come from? Now it's when we the numbers have replaced the name. Even before they want to know who I am, they want to know my birthday. Because they're going to look me up by my birthday, not my name. Where's my individuality? It's a bunch of numbers put together in a way that made sense to somebody. We don't know who or how they're using them. Or how, or if they get the numbers screwed up, and then I don't exist anymore. Crazy world we live in. And you don't know what's real or what's not real. But... I know what has meaning for me, and it's looking as large as I can at the context I'm in. Um, this takes us in one direction, because now we have two points that are in a very specific relationship to that center line. When I take this circle, the points are not visible, so I don't know what the relationship of any of these points are. To them. And this is interesting. Euclid defines the circle by the center point, which we still use. And yet there's no center point here. But there is a relationship. And he acknowledges it. Every line on the circumference has, has the same point. So that all these points have the same line relationship to one point. He never tells us how many points are a circle. And because he didn't ever suggest that there were a certain number of points and lines that make a circle, then we have many generations of geometers trying to figure out what the relationship of these all these lines are diameter. Well, the information is there. This is where it takes reflecting on what we observe. And we reflect it. We folded the whole circle in a ratio of one to two. Two half circles. One whole circle. There's no separation. There's a line of division. It's a triunity. So that tells us if we're going to be consistent, we need to fold it in a ratio of one to two again. There's only three ways to do that. There's only three. Because this order of organization, which initially started with the, the implosion of a sphere horizontally moving out into a circular disk gives us that information one to three so one to two, one to two is three one two is three you can't have one and one because those are in separation there's no relationship one touching another creates a relationship it goes out perpendicular 90 degrees halfway between those two points those points of touching gives us a whole other way to relate you and I touching in some form. The relationship is not measured between us. The relationship is what goes out perpendicular halfway between our capacity to touch. That means 
that our relationship affects every other, all the other points in the circle. That one relationship of two reflects everything else. There is no separation. It's all interconnected. And there's science tells us that. Religions, in its own way, kind of tell us that. But we also have that little fudging. Well, it's not really all interconnected because I'm a little bit more than you. I know more than you do. Come to me, I know. They don't. You see, there's no consistency to the unity of the relationship touching these two points. So the next thing would be, how do I distill all of that information to know what to do next? Most people say, well, just fold that in half into quarters. That's because we've made such a big thing out of the right angle as a thing by calling it that. When in fact, when the sphere is compressing, it's compressing perpendicular to itself. You can say it's compressing at 90 degrees or it's a right angle. That limits the whole functional process. So we fold it. Now, the first thing we folded was point to point. Edge was in alignment. If the points are touching, the edges will be aligned. That tells us align the edges again. Okay, so align them. Now align them in a ratio that's consistent to one to two. So we have one, this is one, this is two. We've divided it into thirds. Don't get stuck on the numbers. What's in half? What's not in half? What's... That's not close enough. Where is close enough? The more you do it, the more you're going to be able to fold it into thirds. Now, how do we know if that's right? Going to turn it over. We're going to take this point. We're going to touch this point. Because it's about touching points. So we touch those and we flatten it down. And now we look and see, oh, it's not close enough. These aren't touching, but these are. So the difference between what's touching and what's not touching, it's that little bit. So if we were to then move this over half of that distance. So again, we're using this ratio of one to two to be able to even it up it's by sliding it back and forth. Okay, so now you move it back. This is kind of clumsy because I'm trying to do it from my perspective, but I want you to see what I'm doing. Anyway, what we've done is we've taken the difference between touching and not touching and slid it back and forth half that distance, one half, and now we have points touching, circumference still lined up, either even, we have a center point, we have a center point. Triangle, there's nothing to discern. Well, here. Now we can see that we do have a center point. That's a point of intersection where the three diameters cross. Took me many years before I decided to look at that second fold. I just, I'm folding it in third, done. Spent a lot of years getting that circle pattern of three diameters, six, seven points as a place to start folding. Took a lot of years before I went back and said, I need to look at the second fold. What's that about? Okay, so I'm just going to draw this in so we can see it where we are. So there's the first fold. The second fold is that. Okay, so I've, I've got it to where everything is even. I want to look at the second fold. So when I unfold it, crease this a little better. Okay, there's the first fold. There's the second fold. So I'm going to 
wrong, that second fold, so you can see it. Okay, first fold, second fold. Unfold it. That's what it looks like. One diameter, two radii. Four points on the circumference. One in the center, five. How do these numbers match up with other observations that we've given numbers to? And what correlations can we make? This is what I call reflecting. Reflecting on what you see, what you observe. So, you know that this is true because this falls this way. This is what's called an origami, a mountain fold going up. This is a valley fold going in the opposite direction. You can see where this goes this way, and this goes the other direction. And that's simply because that one fold is folding both halves in the same direction. So when you unfold it, this one is going in, it's a valley fold. This one is coming out, it's a mountain fold. So if you're not very accurate, they're not coming to the same point in the center. The more accurate you are, the more those two points will come together. Now, when we complete that fold by doing the third fold, and we get everything creased, and we open it up, we can then see, we can then see what normally looks like three diameters, and we think they're intersecting in the middle. And yet they're not. They are one diameter and four radii. And those radii may be in the center or not, depending on how accurate you are in your folding. So you can also see that the second fold, the third fold is just a reflection of the second fold. Okay, that's what the circle tells me in terms of what to do next. It's the consistency of how I observe and the meaning I give to the reflecting on the relationships of that information that I've been given. I didn't make the circle do this. I was just the energy input, the folder, the agency for the circle to move and reveal what it is. And this is only three folds. And the circle is infinite in its possibilities. Why is it infinite? Concentrically, it's infinite, both going in both directions. All right, there's a lot of information here. Again, I go back and I, I, I ask people I'm working with, what do you see that you don't that you didn't have before. What's there? Some will see a hexagon, some will see a triangle, some will see all kinds of things. Some will see rectangles, kite shapes, quadrilaterals. Now, the difference is that here, the two points were predetermined by the choice we made. That gave a relationship of the points to the line. Here, there was no predetermination. It was simply folding it in half and then being consistent with the information we had. I folded it one to two again, which is in thirds. So we're throwing the tri-unity into thirds. We're, we're taking the one to two ratio and doing it again. So there's a consistency about what we've done. And that gives us this. It doesn't give us I, um, doesn't give us the, the quartering. Doesn't give us a 90 degree angle. We only give importance to the 90 degree angle when we can see it. <laughs> and this is really interesting because I'm looking at myself in the screen and for there to be any contact between you and me, I need to look at myself. That's, that's another virtual believe me technology reality. Believe what you see. Don't observe it. So, there we've got seven points. What's the relationship of the six on the outside to the center? These points have a relationship to 
the circle to the circumference. So diameters and radii, they give us what we call a center point. It's a very useful thing. I'm not saying that we shouldn't think of a circle with a center. We just need to understand what that means and that every circle does not have a center. Now, when we take this point and put it to the center point, well, what happens? We can see the shadow changes, doesn't it? Look at the shadow changes. It's all about movement. So let's actually show the relationship of this point to the center point by touching those points. So we touch the points and then we crease it. So we're touching the points and then we open it up. That looks just like the shadow. This looks like all of a sudden there's movement going on. But now it's given us a different line. It's not a radius, it's not a diameter. So I'm going to draw that in just so we can see it. Okay, now we've got a triangle, two triangles that we can see. So we've got three triangles. One, two, three. So it's, it's consistent up to this point. Now my directive was folding in a ratio of one to two, right? One part to two. That's how we got the thirds. So if we continue consistently with that directive, we fold in one to the center, open it, skip this one, go to two. So we go one, two, and fold that to the center, the same way as we did before. Aha! Now it becomes obvious, take the third point, so we've got one to two. So this, no, let's just do this. Now we've got an equilateral triangle. That triangle is a relationship of three points to the center point. The three diameters are a relationship to the circumference. So this is just to a smaller circumference. But we've taken it out of context. We cut, we cut off the size. It's a triangle. No, it's a circle. Never was a triangle only. It can be a triangle or it can be something else. Which is also a little different. Um, let's take this a little bit further. Now we can see we have all the other, all the classification of triangles we had before, but now we have an equilateral triangle. And that equilateral triangle is a relationship of one to two, which is three. The numbers really screw up our thinking. And this is where we need to get away from Euclid, not discounting him, because he was important for over 2,000 years but he's no longer relevant today because we see no, we know more, and we can observe more than he could observe at that time in the development of human capacity. How many points were in the circle? Six on the outside, one in the center. So we have to look at this triangle and say, how many points are there to the triangle? Well, we know there's three, but that's just what we see because of what we've been conditioned to see. We see what we want to see. We don't observe what's there. Observing what's there is, yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven points to the triangle. There were seven points to the circle. What's the difference? The shape, that's all shape is different. That's a circle. That's a triangle. That's 2D thinking. That's Euclidean geometry. That's a logic that has been conditioned into the human mind by mathematical, by the mathematical train of thinking of how to logically give meaning to these things that we can observe. And now that we can observe the 
the circle and the triangle are separate shapes of the same thing. Just like we all folded the circle in half the same way and we came out with different kite shapes. We get caught up in the shapes. We get caught up in this. And then we lose the relationship of outside the inside because of how we define a circle and not because of the concentric nature of what it is. So to go a little further, um, this first movement to the center, that's not all that's going on there. I did this kind of thing for years and years and years before I finally decided to trace that movement or what I would call a footprint. So I've got, I make that movement and I trace it, I open it up and I see something I didn't see before. Now, if I were to, in my mind, follow this line consistently around, all the way around, back to here, I would have two intersecting circles. And this would be the Vesica Pisces. All of a sudden, I'm beginning to take these bits and pieces of information that had meaning within a limited context. In other words, the Vesica Pisces has its meaning geometrically. It has a, a meaning religiously. It has a meaning in terms of relationships. It has a meaning of taking the outside and touching the center. That's what that means. It's not just straight lines, but it's the effect of that movement. And we've isolated out the, the vesica Pisces and then all the vesicas. And if we take this, let me see if I have a, a sample. No, I'm going to take for a moment and just stay with this. I'm going to do this to all the points. Now let's just do it to all three that we do the center. So we're going to trace a footprint to the three folds that we made. Ah, looks a lot different, doesn't it? This is no longer just a triangle. It's no longer just a circle. It's a lot of information there. How do we process that? So that's what we focus in on as a shape. And we can draw that. And we can cut it out. Here, this reminds us of a compass action. We can take the compass, put the center point there, and we get these petal shapes. All right, let's do that to all, all the points. I'm going to fold all six points to the center, which means I'm going to be folding the three points in between what we folded to get the triangle. So we're going to get some of that in-between information, the information we never see because we don't ever take the time to observe what we're doing. So it becomes part of the unknown. We don't know it. In a sense, it becomes misinformation because it's missing, missing information. It's missing the context. So here we have something that's familiar to everybody. It's just drawing it with a compass, except we didn't do it with a compass. We didn't have to figure anything out. There's no construction here. It's just simply by moving the circle consistently to itself with the information that I've been given, I end up with this. 2D and 3D all at the same time. All the stuff you can draw with a compass is here because the circle is the compass and the circle is the straight edge. Think about it. The circle is the compass and it is the straight edge simultaneously at the same time through movement. So all I'm doing is taking the information that the circle gives me and then moving it to be consistent with that information, and it generates this. Now, we can go further 
can say we have these six points, these intervals. Oh, I, I did not, I mean, I didn't draw these in yet, but we need to do that so that we can see full information. Okay. So now we're beginning to make a little more sense on some of these things that we've learned in isolation. We're beginning to see in context. We now have a hexagon, a hexagon star. So we don't see the hexagon. We only see the star. And there is an internal hexagon that we can see. But we don't see this one. But it's there as a relationship. And all we have to do is touch points to reveal that relationship. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to. And in this way, okay. So if all the information was here, which means this bisector was there, then I would be able to line it up and get this. As it is now, what I'm doing is I'm doing the equivalent of two points and drawing a line between them, except I'm folding that line. So I'll do that between all six. Okay. So there's, there's our hexagon. And to, to see that clearly, all we have to do are draw in those lines as we did before, so that it begins to look like the constructed drawings we make that we're familiar with. Okay, so this is all very interesting, but uh, now you can see all kinds of different shapes and relationships of different shapes and combinations. So we can then draw what we just folded, and this is not very accurate, but we're not talking about measuring things, we're talking about proportional relationships, and there's a, a big difference. So now we can see the full circular pattern if we were to use a compass and draw it out, and what we just folded. The difference is the image is static. It's not three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. And this is what we use to construct and prove the logic that has been abstracted from this information. We abstract triangles, we abstract rectangles, we abstract hexagons. All of these things are isolated from context. And then they're given a relationship through symbols and numbers. And we use this to validate and give meaning to the symbols and the numbers. And then we believe the symbols and the numbers are what it is. I can pull this up on a computer and a thousand different variations. Does it really tell me what it is? Does it give me the experience of knowing, of observing and reflecting and using my mind to understand that image the computer is showing me? This is all virtual. This is virtual. You don't know this until you've taken the circle and folded this yourself and did the drawings. And once you have done that, and you can see where the curves, the inside and the outside begin to define each other in terms of what we see, what do we observe about those observations? And what do we observe about the movement and the transformation? Of what's going on here. It's still a circle, and this even wouldn't even be here if I never picked it up and folded it. It would all be isolated concepts floating around, fragments, putting wherever we want to put them, giving whatever meaning we want to give to them. No wonder there's confusion in the world today. We've been 2D thinking, a 3D experience, and a 4D reality, and we're still 2D thinking it and logically proving it. We're beyond that. I'm still the same body I was when I was five years old. But it's different. It's changed. But it's still me. Oh, who is me? What I'm, takes me, who am I? Who am I? Am I five-year-old or am I now? Or am I all those things in between that don't have a number attached to them? All that stuff is wiped when a receptionist says, what is your birthday, as a way to identify who I am. It's gone. You'll never know it's there. 
which is why it has become important for people to tell their story to other people and for other people to listen to other stories, to begin to see that there is real value in the units within unity, the parts within the whole. And there are never two parts exactly the same. Never are those two kites going to be the same. Observation and reflection, and we don't even know what those words mean because we've given that process of growth, that growth process, we've given it a name. Observation, seeing, I see, reflect, reflect. I look in the mirror. I think about myself. How much do I see myself reflecting in others? And how much of others do I see reflected in my own perceptions? What's missing on this planet today is the observation of the interconnected nature. Now, I can say those words and you can understand them, and we all have a different idea of of how to interpret. But if you fold a circle and you create... You create all kinds of things. You create all kinds of things. Is it just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven circles? It's eleven of these guys using both the curved and the straight lines. Not just straight lines, not just curved lines. It's not compass, either or, and ruler, compass and ruler. They're not two separate things. They're the circle. And you're the agent, the folding agent. It brings energy and movement so the circle can reveal what it is. And we need to observe everything about our lives today collectively and individually. But right now, collectively, what we observe and taking the time to observe what we see and then to reflect on that, to think about it. Everything we know, how does that fit in? I'm part of a cosmos. I'm not stuck in a box. I'm not just in this universe, this solar system. I'm not just on this planet. I'm all of those. That's where I am. I'm everywhere. But I'm also an individualized localization of that consciousness of everywhere. And I have a relationship. I have a relationship of being on the outside of this galaxy to the center. And what is my relationship? Not just a straight line in the out. There's a whole world of transformation that happens. And it happens For me, it happens through observing what I do, not what I've done. I reflect on what I've done. And I reflect on what I'm doing when I'm doing it. But the most important aspect is to observe what I do when I am doing it. And the fact that there were three, four kids at the most who were able to tell me in folding the circle in half that they took two points and put them together to be able to look at the circumference to see that it was already in alignment. If we can't get together our education globally, we're not going to survive. We're going to end up war after war after war, taking the circle apart until there's nothing but fragments in space. We are. We have a consciousness. We don't even know what consciousness is. Everybody's talking about what is consciousness. Well, Let's develop a machine that has consciousness, a sentient being, a golem. This has been part of the desire for man for centuries, to create an image of himself in the likeness of himself. That way we can be God, the way Christianity describes humans as the likeness of God himself. Well, it's not quite that way. That's a, that's a nice story. Survived for a long time, still does. But it's not the whole story. Because it's a concept. The only thing that has meaning to me is the experience. 
What is my experience of touching the center? What is my experience of God, of touching God? Whatever I conceive that to be, it's not about God touching me. I don't have that perspective. But it's me touching the most comprehensive, the most inclusive, the biggest thing that I can imagine outside of myself that will allow me to touch everyone else in a respectful and dignified way with responsibility. These are not words. These are not just words. These are the experience that comes out of observing what we do, when we do it, and then thinking profoundly, deeply about it, reflecting into and out from the experience we have. It's the only way we're going to fix this planet and fix ourselves as humanity is if we learn to observe what we do and think about it. And now all that takes time. And our machine today doesn't want us to take time. It wants us to look, 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 look. be influenced by everybody, influencers. Why are there influencers? Because there's somebody out there that wants to sell you something. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to suggest that you give yourself an experience that you've never had before, to begin to understand the circle in a way that you never have, and that will change your perspective. It will put the box in perspective and allow you to leave it whenever you want, or to not go back to it at all. It's always our choice. I don't know what else to say, Nefteris. You. You're not on my screen. You haven't been for the last hour and a half. So I guess I am left with wrapping this up. All I can do is suggest that you get a circle, that you um, explore what it is, see what meaning it has for you. I know what meaning it has for me, and I'm probably going to be folding circles as long as I'm here and maybe long after. I don't know. But when you start with the whole, sure, you can get caught up in the parts and the pieces. They're intriguing. They're beautiful. They create wonderful things. But without the context of the whole, without unity, they mean nothing and they will fall apart. That's fine. Wonderful. No, that was, that was very, very useful. And uh, it was a great... Uh, you know, initiative for us to try and, and, and keep on going inside the circle. Well, uh, I don't know what to say other than what I've already said. Yeah, absolutely. You said everything. You said everything. That was absolutely amazing. Get, get, you know, get yourself a circle and uh, enjoy the experience. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for this um, unusual experience. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs>